I'd like to welcome the 2014 Chairman of the New Orleans Convention and Visitors Bureau, Area General Manager of Marriott International, Mr. Robert Bray. I couldn't be more proud to be one of the 78,000 people that work in the hospitality industry in New Orleans. I was gone for seven years. I lived here before. I had a chance to come back. And uh, when I introduced that concept to my children, my youngest son said, oh, Dad, I was born in New Orleans. We've got to go back. And I said, really, what is it about New Orleans? And Christopher says, with all sincerity, and looked at me like I was a complete idiot. He says, Dad, he goes, I haven't had grits, real grits, like I had in New Orleans for the entire seven years we've been gone. We've got to go back. So that was it. We came back. Um, I want to thank all the people here who participated in the beautification program um, at uh, Louis Armstrong Park the other day. Again, those folks who went on the march with us yesterday, thanks for coming out today. We have things going on at Lafayette Square tonight. Um, thank you so much for all of you who uh, drove in and valet parked today. It's the only way I'm going to make any money whatsoever because I'm pretty sure I'm losing money on lunch today. Thank you all very, very much for coming out. Enjoy lunch today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the President and CEO of New Orleans Convention and Visitors Bureau, Mr. Stephen Perry. Right now, what I'd like to do is just thank, uh, first of all, all of the CVB members, because all of you who are our members, who join with nearly 1,500 companies and countless individuals across this community, make an incredible impact in the effectiveness of what we do, in our sales, and our marketing. Remember, we work for you. We exist only for you. And it has been such a joy this last few, year, few years to see things coming back, to see profits coming back, and tourists coming, and, and the development of our restaurants, and hotel profitability returning and jobs for all of our supply companies and our service companies. So on behalf of all of you, thank you. This is an incredible celebration week. We, uh, I may be a little bit disjointed for a second. I've literally just arrived from Baton Rouge. We've, we have a lot of things going on there. You might have noticed where some interesting discussions with our legislative delegation, with the governor, with our mayor, and a few others. I'm going to save what's happening as of two minutes ago for a few minutes, but I wanted to make sure, first of all, just to thank our host, Robert Bray. And Robert, not just because you're our chairman and such a fabulous hotelier, but hey, every time we come here, you do an amazing job. And your staff and servers and all the folks that work here at Marriott do an amazing job for us. And so thank you for hosting us today. We appreciate it. Look at all of these great partners over the last few days. We, uh, the luncheon is always a wonderful success. It's a great time for all of us to get together and, and be happy, like Pharrell says, but it also to kind of celebrate. And remember why we get together at this point every year. This is National Tourism Week, one of America's most important industries that oftentimes is forgotten outside of the world that we live in. We know how important it is. We know that it drives $800 billion of spending in America, that it employs 7 million people, that it's the seventh largest integrated industry sector in the United States, and that we are really the lubricant of American commerce and the way that, that people, that ideas move around, they flow through us. From the international side, remember, $150 billion are imported into this country and capital each year by foreign visitors. Well, that's an incredible amount, and it's one of the few areas in which the U.S. actually has an export balance in our favor. So, you know, when you look at the impact of what we do, why does it seem like people don't really understand us? Maybe we're too close to them. And maybe it's the fact that we have so many components. But this week is a tremendous week where all across the United States, those of us who serve in the United States Travel Association Board and Executive Committee and those of us who've been such a part of the industry on a, on a national level have rallied around from every community in this country. And guys, y'all have been the leader. We've been the leader here in starting these parades the day before or on National, national Tourism Day. Once again yesterday, 
I mean, y'all saw it on the, uh, in, in the newspaper this morning. You saw it on television, the great visuals of the working men and women of New Orleans from every neighborhood and every kind of business that joined together to celebrate, and nobody in the country had Louis Armstrong with a four-foot head walking down the street. Nobody had mimes and jugglers. Nobody had floats. Nobody had the Warren Easton marching band, I can tell you, or city council people walking with them. It was really great today, because I can tell you, uh, our new council member, Nadine Ramsey, who's taken over in the French Quarter and parts of the West Bank, she walked the entire way with us and made great remarks, and, and we're forever grateful to her and looking forward to getting to work with all of our new council folks. We've got some wonderful dignitaries here today. Uh, I want to thank David Doss, who's here representing Senator Vitter. David, thank you for coming very, very much. And John Young, a lot of you guys know John Young. You know, he, I probably shouldn't say this, you know, he's really our next door neighbor, but the truth is he spends a lot of time down here because I run into him at a lot of the restaurants that are in, that are represented in this room. Uh, John, of course, parish president and for all of you, I'd like you to know that John has done a remarkable job assisting us in a neighboring parish in working to stop this terrible hotel tax bill that's been out there. And so, John, for your work in Jefferson and all the things you're doing, thank you so much. Wouldn't be surprised if we hear other things John might be interested in in the future, but we won't talk about that today. So also, I'd just like to, to recognize a couple of, uh, of folks that are here, and I don't know if they're uh, in the room quite yet, but Bob, is Bob Johnson here yet? Tim, I can't, I don't know if Bob is here. Okay. I want to thank Bob for being such an incredible partner at the convention center. The relationships with us are the best they have ever been. But Bob and Tim and Elaine and the whole crew and their work with our team is just absolutely fantastic. I'd also like to uh, pay special recognition. And I want to, we often, sometimes when people think about us, they think hotels. They think about DMCs. They think about all the supply and service companies. And of course they think about restaurants. But the reality is the partnership that we have forged with our restaurant community has been incredibly profound. And I want everyone in this room to know, and though I'll talk about the details later, the President and CEO of the Louisiana Restaurant Association, Stan Harris, has become one of the most uh, amazing partners we have ever had. I've never seen an association executive that not only operates at 30,000 feet, but I will tell you is in the trenches 16, 18 hours a day, driving the interests of not only his members, but of all of the members of the hospitality industry, and Stan has been one of the inescapably dominant players at the Capitol that has been there every day fighting for everyone in this industry. And I just want to make special recognition to Stan and say thank you for that partnership, Stan. <laughs> Let me hit just a couple of things real quickly before I turn it on, turn it, turn it over to, uh, turn it over to Mark. One of the, uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody who came out to Armstrong Park and worked with us. Uh, the volunteer day was absolutely tremendous. Um, this week, as we celebrate it, we want all of y'all to shout it from the rooftops. I mean, tourism matters. It's not only the multi-billion dollar driver of the economy of this city, it's what pays the bills. It's what generates the taxes. It's what keeps this city flowing. And to those of you in this room who put this city on your back and rebuilt it after Katrina and rebuilt the brand, the employment levels, what an extraordinary job you did. And one of the things that we're trying to talk about is right now is through our advocacy campaign, New Orleans Will, that we have to be not just great business people and not just be the biggest creators of jobs in the city, 10,000 new jobs in the last three years, and the biggest driver of the economy and the biggest payer of taxes. But the truth is we have got to be able to get everyone else to realize that our industry is not just about business, but it's aspirational that we care not only about what happens for our companies, but our employees and across the city. 
And what New Orleans will is going to be about is shouting from the rooftops on every platform exactly what we stand for and what we hope for in building New Orleans into one of the great cities in the world. We've had a tremendous start and comeback, and I will tell you, we are on our way, and you're going to see a lot of things with New Orleans Will, with our grassroots campaign, with our aspirations that we hope will be not only aspirational, but inspirational. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most wonderful folks you would ever meet and hope to work with as a colleague, not only the president and CEO of the New Orleans Tourism Marketing Corporation, and I tell my wife, my actual real life partner, Mark Romig, but also now taken over after all the decades from his dad, the voice of football in the Superdome for the New Orleans Saints, the original who dat, Mr. Mark Romig. Oh. I don't know where to start. It's great to be alive in New Orleans with great people. Thank you, Stephen. It, uh, it's been almost three years since I was able to um, begin the, the role with New Orleans Tourism Marketing Corporation, and it has been a, a real pleasure to get up every morning and know that you're part of a tremendous industry with wonderful individuals like all of you here today, and to do something that you know will have hopefully a lasting effect on our, our economy and on the, the next generation. And so uh, it's great to see y'all, and uh, I'm ready for a Saints season, are y'all? All right. Well, the New Orleans Tourism and Marketing Corporation summer ad campaign, which is our primary effort, is off and running and includes, for the first time, and maybe you've heard about it, a follow your NOLA food truck. We were in Houston yesterday, we're gonna be in Austin tomorrow, and we'll be in Dallas on Saturday. And it's our way to really help uh, enhance the campaign, and a little bit more about that in just a moment. But we've got that happening, we have an enhanced website, and we're all about engaging the experiential traveler across the country. Now there are endless options available, as you know, to engage visitors here and prospective visitors, and we intend to engage as many as possible in our quest to encourage experiencing New Orleans as a wonderful destination. By using the tools around Follow Your NOLA and that great campaign, people will experience and interact with New Orleans in a very personal way. And, and those of you who have been on that website, you know you can really begin to own New Orleans as a site and as a destination. If you haven't, please do it. First, let me give you a little bit about the Follow Your NOLA food truck. It's premiered, it's on the road, and if budget allows, we'll like to do more of this activation next year. We have food, prizes, we hit the Jazz Fest this past weekend, so if you were out there, you saw how exciting it was. And as I said, we're traveling to Houston, Austin, and Dallas. Locals and visitors are able to also follow along via hashtag follow your NOLA, so check that out. Besides tasting authentic New Orleans food prepared by Restaurant Born's Chef Brian Landry, who all of you know is a fantastic young chef and great to work with, consumers are walking up to the food truck and spinning this huge eight-foot flirtily compass, and they're winning prizes at every turn, including cultural experiences back to New Orleans. We have live music. Big Al from the Hot 8 Brass is with us. We have a Mardi Gras Indian, of course, jumping out of the truck. And we have gifts, including many of you in our audience today assisted us with some passes and attraction um, opportunities. So we appreciate for you to do that for us. And also, at each stop, we're giving away an experience back to New Orleans. So. It's a really smart way to engage, we believe. Sending our Follow Your Nolan food truck to Texas first will remind those great neighbors next door that we love them, we're teasing them, and that New Orleans is just a short drive away from our beautiful city here. And we think the advertisement should generate great interest and enough to keep New Orleans top of mind because you know we, we are competing with other destinations for those dollars. Now the city's paid media campaign launched on April the 21st with 15 and 30 second spots featuring the voice of actor John Goodman, a great friend of New Orleans and a resident of our city who has great passion and love for New Orleans, as well as the soundtrack from Professor Longhair's iconic song, Big Chief. The commercials are targeted toward key fly markets with nonstop service to Louis Armstrong New Orleans International Airport, as well as regional drive markets via broadcast television, national cable, and digital media. Additionally, 
The campaign is being promoted via a nationally integrated digital media campaign on partners such as Afar, it's a new one, but it's an exciting one, Bon Appetit, BuzzFeed, The Huffington Post, Garden and Gun, as I love to say it, and Pandora, just to mention a few of them. More to come as our resources uh, in increase with the optional assessment. Now, this is great news, too, because we're able to expand our fly markets. We're in Atlanta, Austin, Baltimore, Boston, Chicago for the first time in several years, Cincinnati, Nashville, Kansas City, San Francisco, and St. Louis. The important drive markets, about 50% of our visitation includes markets such as Baton Rouge right up the river, Columbus, Mississippi, Houston, Memphis, Mobile, Monroe, Pensacola, Lafayette, Shreveport, and Montgomery, Alabama. The followyournolik.com website, again, please go on it if you haven't already, includes a new feature which allows lovers of New Orleans to build their own personal travel experience by creating a map-based itinerary and then, of course, sharing it with their friends. Or users can experience the city following in the footsteps of favorite celebrities who have posted their favorite haunts on the website. We have great musicians like Irvin Mayfield and the artist Terrence Osborne. They signed up, as well as famous chefs such as Emeril Lagasse and Anthony Bourdain. And we even have New Orleans Pelicans basketball star Anthony Davis, among others. So the campaign is also being promoted on New Orleans' official social media channels via Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, Google+, and the goldnola.com culture blog. Please join and follow the campaign at your follow uh, followyournola.com site, neworleansonline.com, or via hashtag Follow your NOLA. One thing I want to make sure that everyone knows is that we talk, as we talk about travel, as we talk about its economic effects, its cultural effects, remember that the very quality of our lives is driven by those experiences we have in our own community. I will tell you, I, I see sitting there a member of our board, Ronald Markham, who if you guys have not heard him play, there is no one that can play that James Booker tradition, to play the complete range of jazz and frankly classical and everything else. But Ronald Markham is not only the president of the New Orleans Jazz Orchestra, but to me embodies so much about uh, the multi-talents of people in New Orleans. Ronald, we're glad to have you here today. And if y'all have not ever heard Ronald play, go listen to him, he will move your soul. Ronald, thank you for being here. We appreciate it and the partnership we have with the Jazz Orchestra very much. Our keynote speaker today has mastered the art of communication, especially communicating with a younger generation, something that <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out. I mean, I have to get my nieces to t teach me how to use my iPhone. Um, Stefan Pollack is a respected PR professional and author. His recent book, Disrupted, from Gen Y to iGen, Communicating with the Next Generation, focuses on the iGen generation, the generation born between 1994 and 2004. I have ties older than that. Um, in just a few short years, iGen will be joining Gen Y as a majority among digital natives. Their existing uh, consumer behavior represents the upcoming mainstream environment, and I don't know what that means. I'm in big trouble. Uh, here to share, because my, my iPhone is like, I, don't, it's, I, I, I only can work in abacus. Um, here to share insight into the importance of communicating with this next generation of travelers. Please welcome our special guest today, the president of Pollock PR Marketing Group, Stefan Pollock. I wanted to thank you very much yesterday for including me in your tourism parade. We represent the Rose Parade in Los Angeles, and this is the first time I've actually ridden on a float. So thank you very much for the, uh, that. But tourism does matter, and we're here to talk about uh, generations and communicating messages. I think you guys heard a lot of stuff about, uh, about how people communicate and all the multi, you know, putting budgets to work and splitting budgets in half so that they can do more. And I'm here to tell you that you're gonna be needing to do more uh, because the generation just behind Generation uh, Y is going to be uh, harder to reach. So just as you guys are getting used to uh, the millennial generation in the workforce and how to target the millennial traveler. And there are actually travel agencies that are focused only on the millennial traveler. There's websites that are geared towards the weekend getaway like WanderWe. You're gonna see a lot of new product entering focused on the millennial traveler. I'm here to tell you that you should also be looking after what's coming next. 
the generation that is right after Gen Y, from 1994 to 2004. This generation is a generation that is seeing the biggest disruption in technology that you've ever seen. We've sat in our office when we were discovering this book, and we were talking about a lot about what you guys talk about in your workplace and your conference rooms as well. How to get Gen Y in the workplace motivated, adapted, and so on and so forth. Well, we were also talking about the technological promise that Gen Y was supposed to have in the workforce. And we click, quickly realized that they're not exactly as technology focused as we thought they were. And that in some cases, my generation knows more about technology than Gen Y does and the millennial generation. So we started talking about and said, what's wrong with the millennial generation in, in this respect? And we quickly discovered that they're not the true digital native generation. If you think about it, they were born in a world still without a smartphone. Or if a smartphone was coming around, it wasn't exactly in their hand all the time as it is today. So the iGen generation, the generation right after Gen Y, is one to look out for. So we started to do a little discussion in our office about what it means to market to this generation, what it will mean to uh, deliver brand messages to this generation. And we can't wait for them to get into the workforce. We can't wait to, for them to get into uh, the, uh, to become adults. So this year, last year, this generation turned 18. They're on their way to college. I have two children, 12 and 14 years old, and they are squarely in this generation. Anybody with uh, children in this generation will know exactly just how hard it is to capture their attention. We as parents have set up boundaries around their online presence and have told them to only trust the people that they know around them. So you'll discover as we go through this discussion about how this generation has built circles of trust and how brands are going to have to penetrate the circle of trust. I teach at USC uh, in the University of Southern California in Los Angeles in the Annenberg School for Communication and I've seen 13 years of millennials and trust me, they don't have, they can't hold a candle to this uh, generation that's coming in. I call them iGen because clearly it's a generation that Apple built. It's been in their hands. Apple was the generation, Apple is the main key driver. They're going to be more than half, you know, as, because of the world's, uh, iGen will be joining more than half of the world's population, which is currently under 30. Think about that. More than half of the world's population is under 30. 50% 50 of the world's population were born after 1982. All right? So there's going to be a lot of disruption that's going to be taking place in the marketplace. So in my 25 years in public relations and marketing, I've witnessed the birth of the website. I've witnessed the birth of the internet and the internet craze. I've witnessed the dot-com burst. I've, wit I've witnessed the 24-hour news channel like many of you have. Information age, mobile, email, marketing. We've seen how email and, and social media have drastically changed geographic borders and boundaries and has caused uh, disruptions in other countries. We've never seen more massive disruption and that is going to change consumer behavior. It already has. It's a dawn of a new normal. Those of you who are the marketing and PR and sales and representatives here, it's something that you're going to have to get your arms around. This is going to be the largest and deepest generation gap from a technological perspective that we have ever seen in our generations. And our success and failure as professionals is going to determine on how well we understand iGen. So obviously we live in a world where the online and the offline world are fused. That is, that is fusion is taking place more and more on a daily basis. You saw it in the Follow NOLA campaign. By the way, I want the food truck to come to LA, right? We also want more direct flights from LA. Maybe we can arrange that too. Uh, but TV is served through computers as we know it. For the last five years in my class at USC, not one student has owned a television set. 
Think about that. You're spending millions of dollars on TV advertising, and for the last five years, not one student of mine has owned a television set. They watch TV. It's just through their smartphone, their tablets, or, other, or the, through their computer devices. And if you're reaching them on Fox News or the local Channel 4, that's not streamed on Hulu. So how are you going to reach them? This is going to be a generation that knows no other world than this. And they have the omnipresent access to the internet, something that everybody should be paying great attention to. And you can thank Apple for upgrading. Everybody, every time we upgrade, we hand me down our phones to the children. Originally, it started as an electronic babysitter for most of us, but the children quickly learned that this is a device that they're going to need to be able to communicate through the world with, right? More than 50% of the children under eight have a device of their own. My own daughter, when she was 10, was the last person in the fourth grade to get, an, get a phone let alone a smartphone. She was the last person. So if you think about it, these kids are entering a world where 60% of all PCs are now tablets. And online video last, year, last year's consumption grew at 135%. If you're not learning how to tell stories in a minute 30 on video online, you've got to go back to school. The world is changing. iGen's growing up in a world that basically has the entirety of its human knowledge in its palm of its hand. Most of us spent decades learning knowledge, going to college, going to university, going to secondary degrees. If you think about this statement, and I'm going to say it a couple times, it no longer takes time to earn knowledge. Think about that. It no longer takes time to earn knowledge, right? So everything is going to be rendered differently. It no longer takes time to earn knowledge. Entertainment and travel and tourism is no longer needs time or place in many cases. New Orleans has an amazing thing ahead of it and an amazing opportunity to grasp it. We're going to enter a world where experiential marketing is going to drive what we do. You own the most unbelievable experience that you have here in your city, and that needs to be shared with the world. Also growing up, iGen can look pretty much anything up, as we know, right? And since they grew up in a world of needing to uh, be in this own circle of trust. Their own social behaviors have, have set up a situation where they have only a trusted circle around them. As brands and marketers uh, start to try and reach out to iGen, they're going to find it very difficult using conventional tools because this circle of trust is near impenetrable. So, Brands are going to have to do a few things, and they're going to have to listen before they do things. Obviously, traditional media to reach is not going to work, TV, radio, print. No one's consuming traditional media the same way anymore. Let's see a show of hands how many people have actually clicked on an ad on the internet in the last week. Not one. I wish I had a camera. <laughs> not one. So those of you spending money on digital ads, not one. You're going to have to rethink things, people. It's going to be a time to change. The other aspect is, is that consumers, especially iGen, are not paying attention to controlled messaging anymore. We in the PR and the marketing world love to sit down and craft beautifully crafted messages and deliver them and create our campaigns and our tactics and deliver them out to the masses and reverse target and engineer all our communication programming built around them. Brands that are going to be successful with iGen are going to learn how to concede control of their message. All right? Back in the last you know, transition, 
people pretty much understand that a brand no longer owns its brand, right? That lives in the hearts and the minds of the consumers. Well, iGen, you no longer own the message in addition to not owning the brand. You're going to put messages out there, but iGen is going to mash them up and repurpose them based on their own needs and desires. So what has been happening? And again, we just had not one person raise their hand. Brands are jumping on the internet like crazy. They're spending tons of money. They're throwing billions of dollars trying to shout over each other. And all that is really happening is that we're all online, Google changes its algorithm, and all of a sudden our SEO is rendered useless. So brands are shouting over each other, trying to be heard. And I'm sure everybody's working through this, and all we're doing is whispering in a crowd. So the smart marketers have decided, oh, okay, well, let's go create our own chunk of space online. We'll bring them to our Facebook page. We'll engage with them there. We'll bring them to our Twitter feed. We'll take them to Instagram. We'll create hashtags. We'll do all sorts of wonderful things. But no one comes. So we end up shouting in a vacuum. Brands are going to have to rethink iGen. And they're going to have to understand that you can no longer whisper in a crowd, and you can no longer shout in a vacuum. You're going to have to do things that generate access into iGen's circle of trust, being present when, they're, when it's contextually relevant to be present, partnering with influencers. And I'm not just talking to a spokesperson that waltzes onto the, the Today Show to deliver a brand message. Partnering with influencers. iGen will smell a paid endorsement a mile away and run the other way. They've been trained to by the parents. Parents have said, no, watch out for that. That's a sponsored message. Don't click on that banner ad, right? So this authentic influencer partnership is going to be really huge. And the other aspect is, is that iGen has learned from the millennials. They've learned what not to do. The, the good of the herd for the millen for for the uh, for iGen, what's good for the herd is good for the individual. They've learned that. The millennials has been what's good for the individual is good for the individual. So think about this aspect of how iGen is going to be in a herd-like mentality, and they're in a herd-like mentality because of this trusted circle of influence. The marketing funnel is dead as we know it. Brands try to continue to push people through from awareness, interest, desire, purchase. We were just in Key West. We were going out to dinner. We were a classic marketing funnel. A friend of ours told us about a restaurant. We read the review. We're walking within blocks of the restaurant. What do we do? Oh, let's see what other restaurants might be of interest, and now comes TripAdvisor. And we look at, sort it by best review, and boom, within 0.6 miles of where we were walking is the best restaurant on Key West, and it wasn't the one that we were recommended to. A couple of Yelp reviews later, whole herd of people diverted to the 0.6 mile restaurant away. Funnels have cycles, and they have become circular, circular now. And you can, it used to be at the funnel, the brand would interact with somebody all the way through the bottom of the funnel. Now every interaction has seven more funnels associated with it and can divert your messages. So what are brands going to be able to do? Since iGen's online all the time, everywhere, online impulse zones, the good old-fashioned retail impulse zone that exists at the retailer when we're at Party City and we're in the checkout stand and they want you to circle through all the all the stuff that you're supposed to buy on your way to the cash register, well, that's 90% of the retail and uh, impulse zones work. So brands are going to have to learn how to fuse impulse zones both in the online world and the offline world when iGen is contextually relevantly interested in what it is that you do. You're going to have to fuse these worlds with tools like Instagram and, and Groupon and Foursquare and other, other, other uh, services that probably haven't even been invented yet. You're going to have to be authentic in your influencer marketing. You heard earlier about uh, driving influencers to follow NOLA, and you, the celebrities have created their own maps. 
well, do the celebrities really actually do those maps, or is it just five or six places that they've, they've heard of and they like about New Orleans? How authentic is that reach? I don't know. It might be totally authentic. Who knows? But think about the influencer marketing and the partnerships that you put together. Content creation and curation. Your brand has to be one of the dots that, the, that is on the exploration journey of iGen. And the truth is, is, is that iGen, again, unlike the millennial generation, will be more lifestyle focused. They're going to turn your brand and expect your brand to be a lifestyle. Again, a sweet spot for New Orleans and every brand that is in New Orleans. New Orleans should excel at attracting iGen and engaging with iGen. Because iGen ultimately wants to be able to love your brand. They just want to love the experience and the journey getting there. iGen's also altruistic. And they want to make sure that there is, again, what's good for the herd is good for the individual. And they want to know that you have a socially responsible um, engagement and that uh, it's part of the fabric of your brand. Listen, hopefully I've woken some of you up a little bit in terms of what the future will hold for each and every one of us. And that we have one chance to try and attract iGen. In this circle of trust, you only get one chance. It's such a circle of trust, it's such a tight circle of trust, that if you come in and you're inauthentic, you're going to be shown the door right away. It's something that everybody should be paying attention to. I thank you for your time and your attention. If you want to learn more about iGen, I've got a book. There are books here on your tables. And uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Stefan Pollock. So I appreciate it. Thank you. How is public relations related to tourism? So tourism is all about PR. It's about getting the story out, creating the excitement for the destination, engaging consumers, and making sure that the consumers and visitors spread the word when they go back to their hometowns. So that is all through PR, uh, generating interest in destinations, making sure that uh, the food is served in the manner that people are expecting, making sure that the quality of services uh, in the manner of people are expecting, and it's all, it's all generated through PR. New Orleans is just a fabulous city. It has a wonderful excitement and engagement, and it is going to be a model for the future of iGen because of the engagement and the uh, experience that is offered here. The tourism industry is all about being hospitable. And in fact, we are, the world, we are world famous for it here in New Orleans. But um, for this group of individuals, recipients of our Above and Beyond Award for Excellence in Customer Care, their generous nature, uh, attention to detail, and bravery is second to none. So the winners, please come to the stage when your name is called. The first winner, um, during a recent stay, Jackie Doys, Felix Rainey, and David Weck with the Windsor Court Hotel went above and beyond the call of service to please one of the most influential, influential and unpleasable celebrities in the world, Oprah Winfrey, who was filming The Butler in New Orleans. And as a result of their attentiveness and dedicated service, they received a letter of praise from Oprah herself and a car. No, I'm kidding, they didn't get a car. Um, <laughs> For, and they got a great, great letter of recommendation for their executive team. Now that is an, an impressive, impressive job. If you can impress Oprah Winfrey, you can impress anyone. Now Jackie, Felix, and David, come on up. James Spears, a bellman at the Sheraton Hotel, called on his past experience serving with the New Orleans Fire Department to respond to two separate hotel emergencies. In the hotel coffee shop, a guest began choking. James rushed to the scene and performed CPR on the guest, then stabilized him until the ambulance arrived on the scene. In April of this year, James once again saved the day. This time, he recognized the signs uh, of a fallen associate uh, was having a seizure. James conducted a series of tests to ensure the associate was not in, serious con in a serious condition and stayed by his side until a medical team arrived. Had it not been for his noble efforts in these two emergencies, uh, they could have escalated and been much worse. Wow, I mean, that that's kind of has hero written all over. James, come up and get your award. <laughs> And finally, David Wozniak uh, started the new year much like many others, going to work uh, all day as a pedicab driver and picking up visitors and, and dropping them off 
repeat, repeat, you know, pick them up, drop them off, uh, until he was heading home after, he was, you know, heading home after a 13-hour shift when his New Year's Day took a, a heroic turn. Along Convention uh, Boulevard, Center Boulevard, David rode past a car that had burst into flames. He noticed a man inside, and instinctively, he pulled him out of the vehicle, saving his life. Because of David's quick response, the man suffered only minor injuries. Saving a life, that is simply amazing. David, come on up and get your award. Everyday heroes right here, right here in our industry, in the hospitality industry here in New Orleans. Now it's time to recognize the 2014 Champions of New Orleans Tourism Award winners. These winners have shown exemplary customer service, provided outstanding hospitality, and are the ultimate ambassadors of the city of New Orleans. They range from our most important customers to generous uh, meeting attendees, good Samaritans, and even local entrepreneurs. First, our first champion uh, did much more than bring their 2013 meeting to New Orleans. Uh, with more than 23,000 attendees contributing $29 million to the New Orleans economy, they gave back in a profound way. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, here to accept the Champions of Tourism Award on behalf of the American Dental Association is Managing Vice President of Conference and Meeting Services, Jim Goodman, and the Director of Annual Meeting and Council of ADA Sessions, Catherine Mills. <laughs> This uh, next champion shows that tourism doesn't just affect the people uh, that work in its industry. Um, last October, exhibitors with uh, Produce Marketing Association's Fresh Summit donated more than 373 pounds of produce to Second Harvest, the largest donation of produce that has ever the um, Harvest Bank has ever received. Here to accept the Champion of Tourism Award today is the Vice President of Meetings and Trade Shows for the Produce Marketing Association, Kent Alloway. Hey, our third winners represent the theme, honesty is the best policy, sometimes. Um, in two <laughs> I'm kidding. I kid because I love. Um, in 2007, Dr. Thomas McCauley, an ophthalmologist from Rhode Island, attended the annual meeting for the American Academy of Ophthalmology in New Orleans. After winning big at Harrah's Casino, he left the casino only to realize that he had misplaced his wallet. He returned to Harrah's to discover that his server, a college student and Good Samaritan, returned the wallet untouched. To reward this young man for his unparalleled honesty, the doctor gave the young gentleman all the money that was in his wallet. It was $8,000, and he gave it to put it towards his education. The Good Samaritan has since graduated from Phoenix University with a business degree and remains friends with the doctor today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Thomas McCauley and Mr. Al Castro. Our last champions of tourism, uh, New Orleans tourism, um, are, are being honored for their hard work um, preserving our unique New Orleans culture. To these gentlemen, the people united for Armstrong Park is a labor of love and a full-time career job, volunteer job, a community organization that is a force to be reckoned with. Together, they are the creators of Jazz in the Park, Armstrong Park's free concert series on Thursday evening. So tonight you go over there laughing, well, I'm the one right in front of, you know, the, where the parades go by. What is the Gallier park? Hall. Gallier Hall. That, you go there tonight, then tomorrow you just go to uh, Armstrong Park. It's a continual festival here, people. Um, anyway, well, senior moment there. I die the gray in. Uh, they put these events on solely to share their love of the city um, to all who attend. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the founder and president, Emmanuel Lane, and the vice president, Ben Harwood. Tell me about the award you just won. An award is awesome. 
um, to finally get recognized um, for some of the work that you're doing in the city, being like the cultural ambassadors, helping to put heads in beds, um, to be recognized by the New Orleans Convention and Visitors Bureau. I mean, it's amazing, and we really appreciate this award. Okay, tell me a little bit about your program. All right, Jazz in the Park is the city's most culturally significant weekly program. We start off with a second line from four to five, and that's providing opportunities to the associate and pleasure clubs. We also have our in-house second line band, and they parade around the park from four to five. And then at five o'clock, we have the opening act, and pretty big acts. I mean, we have like James Andrews as an opening act. Um, Fifth War Weeby, but then at 6:30, then that's when we come with the um, the main attraction, and they usually take the stage at 6:30. But in between that, I forgot to mention, at 6:15 we have an intermission show, and New Orleans has a proliferation of um, dance troops, and so now we have like groups like 610 Stumpers, the Pussy Footers, Disco Amigos. They provide uh, intermission at 6:15. So if you haven't been to Jazz in the Park on Thursday. You're really missing a treat because you get a second line parade, you get um, top flight musicians, you get dance troops. It's just a fun, festive family event that people need to come on out, and we've been getting tremendous um, buzz about it. So come on out to Jazz in the Park. And what organization are you with? People United for Armstrong Park. And tell me a little bit about your organization. Well, we were responsible for the advocacy that got Armstrong Park open after many years after Katrina, I think six or seven years that it took till the fall of 2011. And we helped pressure the city to bring about $5 million into the budget to bring the historic birthplace of jazz back to the public. And since then, we've produced about 40 public uh, free concerts that involve the uh, key elements to New Orleans, African American and backstreet cultures like uh, Mardi Gras Indians and Second Lines and Stilt Walkers and um, Drumming Congo Square. And we are dedicated to preserving and promoting the culture of the Treme and Armstrong Park um, and bringing that to the rest of the city and the world. Okay, and tell me a little bit about the award you just won. Well, um, I think from a tourism perspective, our events help induce people to arrive on a Thursday rather than a Friday so they can extend their trip. Uh, and spend more time and more money in um, the city. And more importantly, I think they get a, a chance to see some real New Orleans. So our events are actually catered towards the locals of New Orleans and um, tourists uh, get a chance to peek in. So they get to have a good time sort of New Orleans style and uh, I, I think an authentic, uh, ex have an authentic experience in an authentic place that is very culturally significant and has long been overlooked and neglected. So. I think we, um, we're recognized for our organization's work to bringing a sort of a neglected gem uh, back into to full luster and um, creating new opportunities for tourism in the cultural economy. Okay, and where can people get more information? People can look us up at armstrongpark.org or on Facebook, uh, Jazz in the Park on Facebook. You know, the Captain Joseph T. Katz Hats Off Award is something that means the world to every employee of the CVB, all of our years with the captain and all that he did for us, involving from Sugar Bowl and with us over the years. And we've named the Hats Off Award after him. This year is an incredibly special award. And instead of us giving it out and talking about it, we're gonna have a woman who's probably she and maybe one other person have booked more room nights in the city of New Orleans than any other human beings, the fabulous Miss Sally Pavlovich. Sally. Thanks, Stephen. Um, the Captain Katz Hats Off Award is presented to a person in the tourism industry that exemplifies the definition of hospitality. Everyone in this room deserves an award. However, only one very special person can be honored today. You can call this person anytime, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and the answer is always yes. This individual always welcomes clients and friends equally with gusto, enthusiasm, and dignity. Everyone is treated like a king or a queen, 
and every person's minute detail is accommodated. This person epitomizes the essence of New Orleans and has a joie de vie for life every single day. Mardi Gras, Jazz Fest, birthdays, and of course, the beloved Saints games are favorites with decked out ensembles to match every occasion. Purple is a passion, second only to black and gold. Entertaining, entertaining doesn't stop at her place of employment. Family and friends are treated like royalty at home and always the quintessential host. Our honoree has been in the hospitality industry for more than 35 years and for 33 years has been an amazing asset to a very special family in the restaurant business. The Casbarians treasure her and she treasures them. This honoree is so deserving that she is the only recipient that has received the Captain Katz Hats Off Award twice in its 24 year history. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to honor my dear friend and one of a kind, Lisa Sins. <laughs> Here to accept her award is the owner of Arnaud's restaurant, Katie Kasparian. Unfortunately, Lisa couldn't be here today to accept this award, so I'm very honored to be here and accept it on her behalf. Um, the irony, of course, is that I'm a terrible public speaker, um, and in fact, for the last 12 years that I've been working with Lisa, I've pretty much begged her to address um, any crowds at Arno's that need to be, A, because she's so good, and B, because I'm so bad. Um, but I would do anything for Lisa, including speaking in front of 600 people today. Um, she's a tremendously special person, and everyone that interacts with her knows that. And so I'm particularly thrilled today that she's being honored again, so that for those of you that haven't had the pleasure of interacting with her, uh, know it too. Like Sally said, she's the epitome of hospitality and embodies the spirit of the city like nobody else. She particularly wanted me to thank you all, especially uh, the CVB and the Marketing Corps uh, for your unwavering support of her and for Arno's over the years. Thank you very much. Hey, I live in this city. Y'all all live in the city. This is our home. We've got a lot to do and they don't have the tools to do it with. So what we've got to do, and we've made a pledge that we are going to step forward despite this division, and we're going to figure an answer out for the city of New Orleans to drive public safety and sanitation and road repair and replacing lights. But we also are going to issue a challenge today. It can't be that government only comes to us. Government has to come and partner with all of the other business sectors. It's time for all of us to sit down at the same table as a community. Whether you're in a neighborhood or whether you're in a business and trade association or whether you're in the law or medicine or you're in manufacturing or you're in service or you're in hospitality, we all have a stake in this. So there's no getting aggravated and saying, man, that was a horrible thing to do. We're really mad that you did it. So. We're going to beat you and then we're going home. We can't do that because public safety, all of these things affect us in our neighborhoods, with our employees, with our businesses. So what do we do? Later today, we're sitting down in a very uh, in, uh, intense negotiations, negotiating se session with senior aides for the mayor. We're going to work on some things that we believe, and frankly, you're very, I think we're all blessed that some of the brightest minds in our industry happen also to be major leaders in this city and major leaders in industry. And this group is going to be sitting down and figuring out what is it that hospitality can do to help this city and help it now, while at the same time continuing to grow the economy and create jobs and create access and opportunity and drive new tax revenues to the city so they have more revenues to work with. So we're beginning that process over the next couple of days. There are some things that we're going to have to work on fast. There are going to be some things that we come up with we hope will be a short-term solution. We'll be looking at a mid-term solution. We'll be looking at a long-term solution. 
But we wanted you to know that there are two things that are absolutely resolute. One, we will fight and battle to the end to keep from having a non-competitive hotel tax that destroys jobs and business growth in this city. That's number one. And number two, despite that battle, we're going to still engage with our legislative leadership, our mayor, our city council, because we want to solve this together. And that's the right way to do it. So we're going to be in the process of doing that. We hope that we'll be able to. We've been involved in negotiations from the governor's office to leaders in the Senate, leaders in the House, uh, members of the mayor's staff. As we get through this, we're going to have something we hope that is going to be real, that will have an impact, and that you guys will be proud of from the industry's perspective. And again, as we do it, we're going to begin the calls to those other business sectors to let them know that they need to be at the table with us. We are invested emotionally, we're invested economically with our resources, so we're going to be there. We're going to be getting into the public communication part and be able to share more about what it is that we're working on and fighting for so hard. But those are our principles and that's what we're standing for and that's what we're going to be working on over intensively over this next few weeks till the end of the session, the first week of June and what we're going to be doing over the next few months to make sure that we not only grow our business, but that we produce the kind of New Orleans that every one of us and every one of our employees is proud of and feels safe being in.